Welcome to the Heart of the Matter. Today we are taking another one-on-one -on -one look at one of our area leaders. We'll meet Glenn Taylor, founder of Taylor Corporation and owner of the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Minnesota Lynx. Stay tuned for the Heart of the Matter. Glenn Taylor is not a spotlight kind of guy. His genuine style belies the great success he's had. Building a multinational company is no small feat, and yet to hear him tell it, it just happens one step at a time, with a little risk taking thrown in. And he continues to explore new concepts. We recently sat down with Mr. Taylor to learn more about his impressive business acumen and why he values his community so much. Glenn Taylor grew up a farm kid. In the years since, as he built a multinational corporation, he's remained committed to rural development and service to his community. Taylor established Taylor Corporation in 1975 with the purchase of Carlson Wedding Service. Since then, he has built one of the largest privately held companies in the United States. In 1995, Taylor stepped into the professional sports arena by purchasing the Minnesota Timberwolves, soon followed by the Minnesota Lynx. Taylor's commitment to public service has been a continuous thread throughout his life. Public office came calling in the form of service in the Minnesota State Senate from 1981 to 1990. Taylor has completed terms on various community boards such as the local YMCA, Chamber of Commerce, and Minnesota State University Foundation Board. He has also made time for state and national efforts such as chairing the Commission on Reform and Efficiency created by Governor Carlson, supporting the Starkey Hearing Foundation, and traveling on international relief missions. A successful businessman many times over, Taylor remains a hometown boy at heart. Mr. Taylor, thank you so much for visiting with us today. You grew up on a farm, and you were a farm kid and grew up in a rural community. Tell us how that shaped your dreams and goals. Well, I think it's really helped me um, in a number of ways. Um, a farm, and we were a large family, uh, is a small business, so I think you learn a lot about just life in itself being raised on a farm. In other words, uh, uh, we, were, we were not a family that had very much money, so we learned to live off the farm. So, I mean, uh, the gardens were very important. The apples were very important. We learned to help uh, my mother with the canning, all the, the boys and the girls, and we had livestock. And so you knew the importance of, of taking care of animals, not only because it was the right thing to do, but because it was uh, a business and the health of the animals and taking care of them was important. So I was very fortunate that way. I have another story that I have told a lot of times in business, but it had uh, to do with my uh, ability to change some machinery and things at work. And the reason I was able to do that is at home on a farm when I lived, when you don't have money, you don't run down to the repair shop <laughs> sure. and say, I want a new part. Uh, we had a, a thing on our farm. We had old equipment in the uh, grove, and then we had an iron pile, a wire pile, board pile, every sure. single pile. So you learn to build things when things broke, or fix things probably would be a better word. And I learned to do that as a child, that you had to fix things on machinery to get them to work. That helped me greatly as I moved into business because a lot of the machinery I used in the early days were mechanical machinery, which I was able to modify and fix and, and, and it made me a lot of money. You have built a multinational corporation here at, at Taylor Corporation, but it started very humbly. And I think people love this story. Uh, when you were in college and you took the job with Carlson Wedding Service, what, what was the first job you had here? Well, that was the first job. <laughs> as I uh, worked for Mr. Carlson and then I came in, um, uh, he put me on a uh, little machine that was called a stamping machine. It was a hand machine, so it's good for muscles and stuff <laughs> like this here. You had to put pressure, pull down, and put designs on paper products and stuff like this here. And then eventually I worked on a paper cutter. But again, in those days, the paper cutter was a handle that you applied, and you just pulled with both arms to pull it down to cut paper. So okay. they were both very physical types of jobs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, eventually I moved into a, a job with Mr. Carlson that had to do with the purchasing of stock and the inventory of stock. And it helped me to get close to him mm -hmm. and to help the company a lot more. So I would say that job of working with the inventory and new mm -hmm. products and stuff like that probably was the, 
the job that helped me to um, continue my future there at, upon graduation from the university. Okay. You originally were interested in being an educator. You thought that would maybe be your career. And what changed your mind? To, what, how did you see the, the prospects in the printing industry? Well, uh, it's kind of, I backed into it. Uh, you're correct. Uh, when I grew up in a small uh, community and we grew up on a farm, the educated people that you knew in your community were teachers or ministers. Mm -hmm. that, sure. That's pretty much it. So. Um, of the two, I decided to be a teacher rather than a minister, <laughs> so narrowed it down to that, <laughs> went to uh, uh, Minnesota State. Um, I had chances to teach, good chances to teach. Mm -hmm. But when I talked to uh, my professors, they said, well, uh, Glenn, you can always teach. You have, because of the, the subjects that you have, there's going to be an opening for math teachers and, uh, sure. and physics teachers. So if you, but if you have a chance to go into business, you might have just this one chance. So I got encouragement from a group of people mm -hmm. that I didn't think would necessarily uh, give that advice. Yeah, yeah, to go into business. I did not have any business education, but I really did like Mr. Carlson. He was a very uh, good person, and he asked me if I would work with him and help build the company. Mm -hmm. So I sort of backed into it, knowing that if it uh, didn't work out, I could always go back to teaching. That decision to take a chance on business led to the development of Taylor Corporation, one of the largest privately owned companies in the United States. Often the general public looks at someone who is as, as successful as you are and they think you have magical powers of insight and business acumen. They're, they're in awe of people who have been so successful. When you go into work in the morning, what's the first thing on your to-do list? Well, I'm going to answer the question a little different. First of all, I give a lot of talks to high school students and the college students that sort of ask me that question, too. What is magic about it? <laughs> Let me tell you, there is no magic about it. <laughs> okay. It's uh, some of it's luck, a lot of it's hard work, and some of it's risk taking. Yeah. So um, I think you have to understand me as to what I think about. Uh, what I think about mostly is my employees. I, I am fairly confident that I can take care of myself and that I'll do well mm -hmm. and that I've, uh, I've just always had that confidence. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about myself and my future, but I do worry about the, the employees that, uh, that I work with, mm -hmm. that making sure that I um, uh, make good decisions, thoughtful decisions, decisions that are in their interest, just not decisions that might help us to brag or Mm -hmm. feel good about something, but are, am I doing the right thing to, to prolong the um, jobs for my employees and, and, and to help them get promoted? And so I would say that's the most important thing I think about almost every day okay. uh, in my work is the leadership that responsibility I have taken by owning the company. Okay. How do you find and retain good people that will help fit in your company and, and help you meet company goals? Again, let me just say that I've met with uh, HR groups and, and people, they ask me that same thing because they want a really uh, um, well thought out answer. So I'm going <laughs> to give you my answer. I do the interview and, and I end up and I say, well, I hire them if I like them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's about that sophisticated. Uh -huh. I, my, my thoughts have always been that uh, the people that I hire, there's a good chance I'm going to work with them lifetime. So it seems like to me the most important thing is that I should hire people that I like. Mm -hmm. Nobody is perfect. Nobody ever comes to you with all the ingredients that you would like sure. to have in a coworker. Uh, so you, you have to kind of pick and choose. But to me, the things, uh, I won't trade on integrity. In other words, they just have to have integrity. And uh, I like people who are willing to take some risks because I think life is like that, mm -hmm. that everything's not guaranteed. You've got to take a few risks, and there's some chances in your job and work mm -hmm. hard. And, uh, but the like them is a really important thing to true. me. So I have ended up hiring a lot of students uh, that have come to us, and they started with us perhaps at 18 years of age, right out of high school. And they work here to get through school. So some of the things I like about them is here are students that are going to school. Uh, they still get good grades, so they've learned to use their time wisely. Uh, they come to work on time. They do all the things, so they, they're responsible. 
So these are things I like about them. Sure. And uh, so I've ended up hiring a lot of fairly young people that I think that have just shown that they're hard workers, they are, they're organized. And then the last part, like I said, I like, uh, I like their personality. Like, okay. uh, that's probably been the group that has been the most meaningful for, mm -hmm. to me in life that uh, so many of them have been students. Others have been just people that I've met in the community. Okay. I mean, so it has not been unlike me to have a, a waitress uh, uh, serve me at a restaurant and, <laughs> and I'm saying, wow, they have a great personality uh -huh. and they're efficient. I, do you like your job here or are you looking for something else? Sure. And it's only mostly because I like them. And then I say, well, if you're interested mm -hmm. you know, in, in coming and come up and apply for a job. With a multinational corporation, how difficult is it to keep track of all the operations? I mean, it's mind-boggling it, almost. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, and I don't want to even to imply people that, that I know exactly what's happening in all of our businesses. So the way I do it is I've subdivided our company up into, um, say, like 70 different companies. And I look for a team, maybe three or so, to run that team. I'm probably on them in the first year so much that they say things to me like, don't you trust me because oh. <laughs> you're, ch you're checking everything that I'm doing? Uh -huh. And I'm saying, no, I don't plan on watching you probably for the rest of our lives, but I want to know how you make decisions and do things mm -hmm. at, at the beginning. So the way it works out is that I initially learn a lot about the individual, then I trust them a great deal. They run the companies. You have also uh, expanded into some agriculture interests, maybe returning to some of your roots in, in terms of interest in livestock and so on. Um, how is that going, and, and do you find that as interesting as your, your printing businesses? Well, I, I find it very interesting to be in agriculture because I grew up on a farm and it has changed so much. You know, I worked with my dad and my brothers and stuff like this. Their farming is a huge business, and we're into it in a in a big way. We have a lot of land, uh, both in Minnesota and Iowa, and uh, I'm one to go down there and get on the combine. My wife comes with me and we sit there and we love to work with the, the crew uh, to do the harvesting and, and um, just to, you know, the feel of what's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, in the fields and, sure. and to, the, to the markets. So it's been very um, uh, educational. Yeah, I, I'm very involved in it. I know a lot about it. I'm, I don't say I'm an expert, but uh, it actually has been a very good business for us. Mm -hmm. Nice to see the seasons go by, too, in an agricultural year. Yes, it is. One of Mr. Taylor's more high-profile businesses is the Minnesota Timberwolves professional basketball team. Its operation has been unlike any other company he's run. Many people in the Mankato area are familiar with you because of the business that you have built here, but many Minnesotans kind of got to know you when you got involved with the Timberwolves. Um, many franchises have been up for sale throughout the years. Why did you decide to close the deal on the Timberwolves? Right, it is not anything that I anticipated doing. I always thought it was for the rich people <laughs> would do that, and I wasn't going to do it. What happened is the, uh, the Timberwolves were going to move from Minnesota, and uh, they were going to go to New Orleans or some other place. Mm -hmm. At that time, uh, Governor Carlson was our governor, and I had served in the legislature, so he knew me from that way, and then people knew me as a business person. He asked me to be a, a, the community servant and to go up there and to see if I could help the owners and people who were interested in buying them, but who would keep them in Minnesota mm -hmm. as a kind of a service to Minnesota. Sure. So it was a volunteer job that I went up there and got involved trying to help uh, keep the team in Minnesota. So I spent some time uh, doing that. The end result at some time, it never did happen. And, and then after it all fell apart, uh, the owners and a group of people came to me and they said, well, even though it didn't happen, you seem to be the only one that knows how my, you might make it happen. Would you mm. be interested? That was on a um, Monday. And I said, let me think about it. On Tuesday, I went up there with a couple of my people that I work with here in Mankato and we did a study and on Thursday night we came to the conclusion that we were going to make an offer. Friday morning we made an offer 
um, but it was a handshake offer uh, that was accepted. Okay. We had not talked to the league about it, which I mm. found out you're supposed to do all those things. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, we did it sort of on the spur of the you moment got it done in five and, days, yeah. and uh, figured out how we could finance it, figure out how we could um, keep it in Minnesota, and uh, uh, really got the, uh, the thing um, done. It's been a a very interesting, you know, part of my life, a very mm -hmm. different part of my life sure. than the other part. And how is the business of basketball, professional basketball, different than running Taylor Corporation? There's very few things that are similar. It's, it's such a different um, type of business. It's very public, even though the Timberwolves are, um, I have lots of businesses, and in, in, in the total, it's not a real significant part of my business. Mm -hmm. Um, everybody would assume it's my most important yeah. business because by far it's the most public mm -hmm. business. So you have everybody um, um, pitching in and what you should do. So I would share, it's, I served 10 years in politics. I was a state senator from mm -hmm. this area and then the minority leader up in the Senate. It's more like my being in politics than it has to do with business. In other words, okay. it's a very public um, position that you have to explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And no matter how you do it, you're doing it wrong, just like <laughs> politics. <laughs> sure. so, you, uh, so I probably learned more about politics that have helped me uh, than in business. Okay. It's so different than the, the normal way. The wages and stuff uh, have nothing to do with the typical wages that you, mm -hmm. you would uh, think about that you would sure. pay people. It's more like the movie stars, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. someone who writes a song uh, it doesn't seem like a lot of work, but they get a really a lot of money if it's a very good song. Mm -hmm. I would say you know, basketball is sort of the same way. It doesn't seem like a really a lot of work to go out, turn, bounce the ball, and shoot <laughs> it, but they get a very lot of, uh, of money. So it's a very different uh, type of business. Um, I can't equate it to my other businesses. I like it because it is different. I like it because it is very competitive. Mm -hmm. But it's been a... It's been a um, um, kind of heartbreaking because I haven't done as well at, with it as I'd hoped. Mm -hmm. What's your, what, how would you define your team's personality? Well, uh, it has changed um, from time to time. When we first started out, we started out with a group of players that had lost, so we built a bunch of young players and we built it every year. And we said a couple of things. We wanted to, the players to have a lot of potential. In other words, we thought that they could get better on the court, but we also said that it was important to us in Minnesota that we take a type of player that's respected in Minnesota, respects the citizens of Minnesota, gives back mm -hmm. to that. And so today we're again at that place. We've started over. We have a, a group of young men, and my links is mm -hmm. the same, right. young women uh, that have a lot of potential, but they are very good young men and women in the sense that they are very respectful, they care about the community, they, mm -hmm. do, they do the things that we ask them to do to help within the community. So that's the characteristics that we uh, want in our players. So we basically just say they should be people that we're proud of on and off the court. Oh, cool. That's kind of our model. All right. And, and you mentioned the Lynx. You do have the women's professional basketball as well. And, and I noticed in the NCAA tournament that, that every once in a while a, a, a woman, young woman player will kind of get a little stardom in there. Uh, do you see potential for growth in professional women's sports? They always kind of seem to take a back seat to the men. Yeah, I think it's a difficult one. Um, it isn't a sport yet that, you know, I lose money on the length. And I think just about every other owner does also. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I look at it this way, you know, the, the men's teams uh, have done very well and we, you know, I'll probably make money off the Timberwolves because I bought it at a reasonable price. Uh, so I think I have a responsibility in the state of Minnesota to take some risks and, and just to take some chances. So hopefully it will become profitable, but uh, we have a lot of women and young women, girls, who come to the games and with uh, their families. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we want to show that uh, women should have the same equal opportunities in sports. Certainly they don't get paid as much, mm -hmm. but they uh, have a chance to have a, a fun, competitive environment 
And uh, it isn't going to happen unless somebody like myself takes the leadership and say that we're going to promote it and, and, and stay with it. Taylor's sense of responsibility to a greater cause can be seen in his many volunteer activities throughout the community, as well as his commitment to remain in the Mankato area. Community service is important to you. Why is that? Well, there's two parts. For me, I've been very blessed, and it's part of giving back. But I also encourage all the people at my companies, and I encourage um, students when I talk to them, to get into um, some community service. I, I've never directed anybody into any particular one. I just think there's so many different kinds. It could be helping disadvantaged people. It could be coaching youth. It could be, you know, mm -hmm. building, help building a house or sure. doing all kinds of things. I just think it makes you a better person. I just think you get, uh, we're very fortunate, a lot of us, that we have good health. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have a job. And there's other people that don't have those things. And one, if you get too far away from it, I think you could say, oh, those people, they must be ignorant or they must be, they must be lazy or something like mm -hmm. this here. And yet you find out when you get into uh, community service, there's a lot of unfortunate things that happen to a lot of families that are just absolutely no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. And you uh, have a better understanding of how you can help those people and to do it. And I think it just makes you a better person in, and I, I think for my employees, I just think when they come to work, they're better with their fellow employees, they're better with their customers, uh, if they understand uh, you know, what goes on in the world, not only all the good things, but some of the bad things that happen in, in life. So I encourage it because, um, well, first of all, I think it's the right thing to do, and it's probably, uh, I think it's in most of us. We know it's probably the right thing to do, <laughs> sure. and we have to share. Um, but I, I, I don't have any problem with saying that uh, my service to um, the community has helped me. You know mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. Frank, I, not only have I given to the community, but I think the community has given back and made me a, a stronger and better person. Of your volunteer projects, what is currently on your passionate to-do list? We do. We travel around the world to areas that are very poor and put uh, hearing aids into uh, kids that have lost their hearing. And uh, we do that each year. I, we do it to help the kids, but we also do it, we take some of our family members along to give them appreciation of what's, what's really happening out in the world. Sure. So that's kind of um, been one of our main projects that we've been doing as a family. As you built your business, I'm sure you were wooed by a number of other larger cities, other states to move your company headquarters or your operations to other places. Why was it important to you to stay right here in this community? Well, there's a couple of basic things I would just say that I'm not different than anybody else. I think a lot of us like to be around our family and fairly close. And my, it, it, as it works out, then my brothers and sisters and my wife's brothers and sisters are a lot of them are from this area. So we like and now we're grandparents, and so we like all that type of stuff. So I'm saying, I think that basic thing holds you. But the business part of it would be is that um, I have found that, in not only in Minnesota but in the Midwest, that the, the people I can relate to very easily. They're very productive people. They're people that I have I have been able to motivate. I have the opportunity to have plants in the West Coast, the East Coast. The, southern United States and in a lot of other countries. Um, it is harder for me to motivate those people. It is harder for me to understand those people. So in fact what we have done in a lot of cases is move people from Minnesota out to those plants to be the leadership because I can communicate better with them and understand them. So I don't know, you know, I mean it's hard to say that the people here are better than other people, but they are certainly people that I have found to be more productive in my particular system mm -hmm. and my particular way of communications. So there's times that, uh, that maybe other locations are better than Minnesota, but, uh, but you just take a whole bunch of things and, and there's some very good things. Mm -hmm. The very good things usually are around the people, that it is a very uh, good uh, group of people that work very hard. They are a group of people that um, 
um, add value, they, ha they add ideas and stuff like that when you don't even ask them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, those are, if you're going to grow your business, you need those type of people around you. So people are probably what has kept me here in Mankato. I, I uh, personally, um, I guess the main thing that has been brought is to move up to the Twin Cities, and, and mm -hmm. most businesses assume <clears throat> that I am up there. Right. I, I like um, Mankato's um, friendliness. I like it as a place to raise my family. Um, I like it that um, that I sort of know what's happening. It's a small enough community to do that, mm -hmm. and I know that. Um, even so that a lot of my employees live in even smaller communities in southern Minnesota sure. and they really like it because they, they, they like it that they know where they're, what's happening to their children in school, they mm -hmm. know their neighbors, they know things like this. Those are all things that I appreciate. Mr. Taylor, you're in business and times have been a little tough here in the last few years. What do you see in the future? Well, I'm going to give you the same answer that I share with my employees. I understand that the economy has been bad and we've all taken our lumps from that. I also understand it's going to be uh, uh, difficult in the future. But I'm very po positive. I, I just see that there are um, so many good people, people who want to work, they want to work hard. I also see some good young people who are coming into our workforce with ideas and stuff like that. So I believe that companies like ours can grow uh, not only here in the United States, but we can uh, learn to grow uh, by either buying products from other places in the United States or in the world and then mm -hmm. selling products to other places in the world mm -hmm. so that we be can become an international company even though we're in Mankato, uh, Minnesota. So I'm positive about that. It's going to take hard work, uh, but pulling together, I still think the United States has some great resources. There's no reason that we should uh, fall back and become a subpar country uh, and I'm going to do my uh, part uh, you know to make sure that that happens here in Mankato. Yes. Mr. Taylor thank you so much for visiting with us today appreciate your time. It was great fun to visit with Glenn Taylor his dedication to his business and the surrounding community is an inspiration for us all. Please join us for the next episode of the heart of the matter where we take a look at the exploding use of social media. For Donnie Rolls I'm your host Stephanie Passingham. Good night.